Brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you. Welcome to this time of worship on this Lord's Day in this Lord's house. It is a blessing to be together with all of you to see some familiar faces, new faces, and all kinds of good people coming up and sharing in time today uh, as we worship our Lord together. Now, for one, for one thing, I need to go ahead and let you know that um, our masking situation has just changed, right? 
Uh, the session last week decided that given the fact that the, our, uh, Prince Edward now is in, is in the low category for transmission with the CDC, we had decided that masking is optional. Certainly we encourage anybody, who, and, and by all means, if you would rather wear a mask, you are welcome to wear a mask. But you do not have to, as long as you are fully vaccinated, that we require, uh, you know, we, we do ask that people um, be safe about it, and as safe as we can be still. Um, it's still a crazy times in which we live, but, um, but the masks no longer are required, like I said, as long as you are fully vaccinated and don't have any COVID symptoms. Um, but there you go. Hopefully that is a nice thing, <laughs> nice thing to hear. Um, but if you want to wear a mask, by all means, you're welcome to. Okay, other things. One, uh, if you have not picked up your fish box yet, uh, the fish bank for our Lenten uh, mission project, you are uh, encouraged to. There are still a number of them out here in the hall that need uh, some love, need to be filled. You got to feed them, right? That's what we're doing is feeding the fish. That's kind of weird. Um, but yeah, feed the fish and bring them back uh, anytime before Easter, and we will uh, ship those. The, the information for that, of course, is in the bulletin insert, and uh, there's some great stuff in there, uh, great opportunities, great uh, missions that you can help build, and, and I love the fact that we're trying to empower people. Uh, it's, it's even less the dollar amount, more just the number of gifts trying to get people to um, show the support and encouragement for these uh, fine folks. Uh, as a reminder, our affirmation of faith today is again uh, in the bulletin insert when we get to that point in the service from Colossians 1. Um, also, if you want to uh, order an Easter lily in memory or honor of somebody, that form should also be in the insert there, another insert in your bulletin. And uh, I think that's about, well, I did want to say too that um, we are working on updating our church directory, so that if you have any information, updates, additions, whatever, uh, that you want to make sure we have as we update our directory, do let the church office know. Um, and there is, as I hear, it says that um, about Ukraine, just the absolute horrible situation going on over there. If you would like to help uh, financially, the missions that are at work over there through the Presbyterian Disaster Assistance Program, there is uh, information about that in the hall. Also, um, you know, I, it's just it's mind blowing. But um, and I can't imagine being there. But as we keep them all, our brothers and sisters, not only in the Ukraine, but uh, also in Russia, in our hearts, all of those affected in this terrible, terrible time, as so many people are suffering, um, we continue to hold them in our hearts as people of faith together in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Let us embrace this time of worship together, friends. Let us go forth boldly as people of faith. Let us offer to God our very best. Let us remember that we are here not only in present in person, but also with those gathering with us wherever they may be across the internet. Thank you for being here today. Let us worship God together.
We do survey God's grace at work around us. We look to see it, to behold it, to feel it, to know it in our lives. Let us embrace this opportunity with our call to worship in the bulletin, friends. Join with me. O oh God, you are my God. I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands and call on your name. My soul is satisfied as with a rich feast, and my mouth praises you with joyful lips when I think of you on my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. For you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I sing for joy. My soul clings to you, your right hand upholds me. Join me now in our first hymn, which is hymn number one, Holy, Holy, Holy. We do behold the glory of God as people in faith together, do we not? And yet we also recognize our personal struggle, our constant everyday struggle with the ugliness of this world and the sin that we carry with us in our lives. It does not own us, but it is too much, far too much a constant companion. Let us give all of this to the Lord together, friends, with our prayer of confession in the bulletin. Join with me in our prayer together. We are here to follow in the steps of our Lord. 
Our pace in life is so uneven. We rush when we should slow and stop when we should go. We walk past the real need around us and shuffle in indifference to the plight of our sisters and brothers. Do not let our steps lag in your love, but rise in your grace. Forgive our weak stride in faith. Thank you, O God, for hearing us upon the lips of our Savior. You have called us to be more than a people in need. We are a people in need who has received your gracious and lavish love to remake us as your children of love. There is no sin that cannot be undone in Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Yes, friends, it is good to be here today with you to know without the shadow of a doubt as a family in faith that we are alive and free in Jesus our Lord. Let us recognize that with our assurance of pardon in the bulletin. King Jesus is good and faithful. His commitment to our life gives us new life in him. His commitment to God makes us all family. In our King we live. In our King we love. Amen and hallelujah. invite you to join with me in prayer. Oh God, thank you for the beauty of this day. We ask that you share the beauty of this moment as we entrust ourselves to you and to your spirit. We entrust ourselves to your word. We entrust yourself, we entrust ourselves to how we live that word together. Open up to us your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our first lesson, friends, is actually the entire 35th chapter of Genesis. There you go, Sadie. we got to start big. Join with me in Genesis 35. Ah, um, oh, this is so good. All right, follow along in your own Bibles. The few Bibles are simply in your hearing, but receive God's word. God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and settle there. Make an altar there to the God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods that are among you and purify yourselves and change your clothes. Then come, let us go up to Bethel that I may make an altar there to the God who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave to Jacob all the foreign gods that they had and the rings that were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the oak that was near Shechem. As they journeyed, a terror from God fell upon the cities all around them so that no one pursued them. Jacob came to Luz that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan. He and all the people who were with him, and he built an altar there and called the place El Bethel, because it was there that God had revealed himself to him when he fled from his brother. And Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died, and she was buried under an oak below Bethel. So it was called Alon Bakuth. God appeared to Jacob again, when he came from Paddan Aram, and he blessed him. 
God said to him, Your name is Jacob. No longer shall you be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. And so he was called Israel. God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you and kings shall spring from you. The land that I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I will give to you and I will give the land to your offspring after you. Then God went up from him at the place where he had spoken with him. Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he had spoken with him, a pillar of stone. And he poured out a drink offering on it and poured oil on it. So Jacob called the place where God had spoken to him Bethel. Then they journeyed from Bethel. And when they were still some distance from Ephrath, Rachel was in childbirth and she had hard labor. When she was in her hard labor, the midwife said to her, do not be afraid for now you will have another son. As her soul was departing, for she died. She named him Ben-Oni, but his father called him Benjamin. So Rachel died, and as she was, as, and she was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. And Jacob set up a pillar at her grave. It is the pillar of Rachel's tomb, which is there to this day. Israel journeyed on and pitched his tent beyond the tower of Eder. When Israel lived in that land, Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard of it. Now the sons of Jacob were twelve, the sons of Leah, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun, the sons of Rachel, Joseph and Benjamin, the sons of Bilhah, Rachel's maid, Dan and Naphtali, the sons of Zilpah, Leah's maid, Gad and Asher, these were the sons of Jacob who were born to him in Paddan Aram. Jacob came to his father Isaac at Mamre, or Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had resided as aliens. Now the days of Isaac were 180 years, and Isaac breathed his last. He died and was gathered to his people old and full of days, and his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. Your second reading is in Matthew's Gospel. And yes, we're going for a hat trick today, so you get three. Matthew 10, 1 through 8. Then Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Ma Ma Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Cananean, Cananean, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, give without payment. The word of the Lord, my friends.
our third lesson today, friends, is all the way at the end, going to Revelation chapter 4. Join me uh, at verse 2. At once I was in the Spirit, and there in heaven stood a throne with one seated on the throne, and the one seated there looks like jasper and carnelian, and around the throne is a rainbow that looks like an emerald. Around the throne are 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones are 24 elders dressed in white robes with golden crowns on their heads. Coming from the throne are flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder, and in front of the throne burn seven flaming torches, which are the seven spirits of God. And in front of the throne there is something like a sea of glass, like crystal. I have a confession to make. My uh, sermon title today has absolutely nothing to do with the sermon, uh, pretty much. Um, I did that planning a while ago, and I thought I was going to go in a different direction today, specifically with the 12 sons of Jacob. And also, I kind of wanted to impress you that even though I'm a young pup still, I do remember, you know, Lee Marvin and Ernest Borgnine and uh, Telly Salavas uh, and, you know, that, that group. Back in the day, uh, I have seen the movie, yeah. Um, oh, Charles Bronson, yeah, don't forget Charles Bronson. Oh, my goodness. Uh, but I am going to come back to the 12 sons. Don't, you know, don't think I'm going to ignore them. No, they're still really relevant. They're very relevant, but they're not the focus of where I'm going uh, right now. I need you to continue walking with me as we're going through the season of Lent, Okay. We're in the season of Lent, we're right in the middle of it, we're going through this, and we're on our way to the cross. You know, that anthem kind of helped to get us there, right? To take us in this direction, we're journeying to the cross and the death of Jesus. Uh, but we are traveling that way through the stories of Genesis. And today, you know, we've gone with Sarah and Abraham and Rebecca and Isaac, and we continue with Jacob. We're actually coming somewhat kind of to the end of the Jacob section and this is, this is really important. This, this chapter is kind of where the rubber meets the road for me. It's kind of where the whole stage gets set for what's next. And here we finally get to see kind of the plan of what's coming. Of course, nothing gets easier. If you had asked me before what chapter 35 of Genesis was about, I... Uh, uh, confession, I couldn't have told you. I, I would have had no idea um, really what was in that particular chapter. It's not one that you would necessarily hold on to. Um, it's not one of the really memorable ones. That, you know, Rachel dies in that one, and, and you do get all the 12 sons named for the first time. So that can be significant, but I was completely wrong. This is a fantastic chapter and a memorable one for me, because something really powerful is going on right here that I think we can all relate to. I certainly hope we can. And this is also where we see God's signpost, where things are headed. When the door is closed, what do we expect to open? Well, if you said your pocket to pull the key out to unlock the door, you're probably more realistic. But, but as people of faith and how that expression has showed up before, you all know how that's supposed to go, right? When a door is closed, what opens? All right, yeah, yeah, it's almost there. A window, I think I heard it. We know that, right? The window opens. Uh of course, that is a strange thing to say. Are we really supposed to make a habit of going through windows? I, I really don't recall going through many windows in my life. Some of that's my size and flimsy windows. Um, I was thinking, Emma, was it your mom who had a thing for going through windows? 
I seem to remember that at some point. There are some of us, though, who do travel through windows. Um, and I'm wondering if this is maybe one of those tall windows that go down to the floor. Maybe that's where they're headed with this idea. But this is something that stays with us, doesn't it? I'm going to run with this proverb a little bit. When we find a door closed in life, we are supposed to expect a window to open, right? God is providing help even if it's unexpected, maybe especially if it's unexpected. After all, I can imagine, um, I, can ima I can't imagine any of us choosing a window over a door. The idea, though, is that when we suffer loss, right, when we suffer some kind of loss, there's also supposed to be an opportunity, a way forward, a gain, something. When something is taken, something else is supposed to be given. Now, to be honest, this can also be a very dangerous idea. One way of reading this is that God somehow tears us down so that we can be built back up. Stonewall Jackson, um, back in his good Presbyterian years in Lexington, Virginia, before the Civil War, uh, suffered the loss of his first wife and his first child. She, at the same time, she died well, the child was stillborn and she died giving birth to this child. A truly horrible thing. Unimaginable, but more common in those days. What's also horrible to me, though, was his response. When he said that God took them away from him because he loved them too much. That's not where we need to go with this image. That's not where we need to go with this line of thinking. I hate that people through the centuries have somehow felt that God hurts us to see how much we can take or to make us better in faith or to be better people or to teach us something. That's malarkey. I reject that notion. If anyone really wants to explain how God loves us and steals our loved ones out of jealousy, Please explain that. Seriously, some in our congregation right now in this very moment are deeply wrestling with severe emotional weights of their troubles and sufferings, enduring loss that I cannot imagine. God is not trying to break us. That is not love. Life is hard enough as it is. We face bad enough loss already. This world is constantly taking from us, but God is the one who walks with us and also provides. That case in point is Jacob. Every paragraph in this chapter is an experience of loss, regular, ordinary kinds of losses that we face all the time and have even more through the last couple of years and continue to face. Too often it seems like we might be moving forward to something in life and then something snags us and pulls us back. But God is in the midst of that too. The author here wants us to see that God never abandoned Jacob or his family. First, Jacob has to, uh, he tells his family, they all have to give up their foreign gods, right? The little household gods, the ones that, well, and Rachel actually had a problem with this before. Uh, give them up. I don't know why they didn't destroy them, but burying them, that's better than nothing. Get rid of them. Uh, those old, comfortable gods are gone. <coughs> Second, Rebecca's nurse dies. Now, what's interesting about that in particular is that we know her name. Women in the Bible don't get named very often, especially not somebody who doesn't play an important role. She must have been a significant person 
in that family. Jacob's mother's nurse dies. Deborah, or maybe Deborah. Third, Jacob loses his name. Now, you got to stop and appreciate that. He loses the name that he's gone by for his whole life, right? His identity was tied to that name up to this time. You know, I don't know if this, the family could still call him Jacob, but when God says, your name is now Israel, I'm guessing that that's pretty much what everybody was supposed to call him. So that old part of himself was gone, that name association. Fourth, and this is a hard one, Jacob loses his favorite wife. Rachel dies in childbirth, and she was the whole reason he got into that weird work relationship with Laban, her father. He worked 14 years to have her as a wife in total. She was his light, his joy, and now she was dead. Fifth, Jacob's eldest son, Reuben, has relations with one of his concubines, the mother of some of his brothers. This was a bold act of defiance. Reuben is showing his father that as far as he's concerned, daddy is no longer. He is similar to that younger son in that prodigal son story who steps up and insults the father by asking for his inheritance. Now, he's treating his father as if he's already dead. That's a great injustice. Lastly, Jacob's father dies. Jacob and Isaac had never really been the closest uh, if, of, in relationship, but, but there was love there. And it was his father who gave him the blessing to begin with. He honored his part in all of this. Jacob lost him. Every paragraph has a loss, a door closing, and Jacob lost in that grief. Every paragraph has a pain, but every paragraph also has a gain. First, the family, being freed from their old household gods, are now free to worship the one God, right? The living God. They're free to follow this God who's been calling them and leading them and walking with them. Second, while traveling through this enemy territory where God is taking them, God gives them safe passage and peace. Nobody messes with them. Third, that name uh, that Jacob is given, Israel, will be the name that stays with this people for all time. Israel represents the very people in their struggle with God. Basically, God is naming all of them after Jacob as Israel. Fourth, Jacob did receive a dear and precious son from his favorite wife. His two favorites are both the sons of Rachel, Joseph, and Benjamin. Benjamin is most dear to his father. Fifth, Jacob does not dignify Reuben's actions, but the text shifts to the entire set of sons and, he, and names them for us. He has 12 sons and they will be the people of Israel. They will all become tribes and the entire people, the future of the people of God is named right there. Sixth, and this is precious to me. You notice who helped whom bury Isaac. Jacob and Esau both buried their father together. Esau and Jacob are past being enemies, past being at odds, past the hate and resentment. They are brothers in all that that means. They both loved their father and honored him in that shared burial. What a beautiful statement at the conclusion of their relationship. Right there. Right there in the losses, they also found gains. 
blessings in the hurt and pain. Now, I'm not trying to say it's all fair or even or that one balances the other. You know, it's not about replacing loss with a gain. What I'm saying is that life, in life, we have an inherently optimistic view with God. This is so critical and so important to me, and I suspect it might be for you. If there is no hope, if there is no future, if there is no coming good, then we are a people to be most pitied, as the Apostle Paul says. He Here is God, uh, is God in this beautiful, subtle, but profound way showing us how life works in God's grace. This brings us back to the sons that I promised to revisit. As I mentioned here, in the midst of real life, Jacob and his family had ups and downs. He was crushed by the death of his wife and no doubt saddened by the loss of his father, but he still had his 12 sons who would become the 12 tribes of Israel. What I want you to see is just how big a picture God is painting here for all the people of God. In Genesis and through the Old Testament, we have the tribes. Then Jesus calls his 12 disciples and sends them out to do ministry. It's no accident that Jesus calls 12 and names those 12 the same number as the sons. The disciples, the apostles, reflect the tribes and the wholeness of God's people, but the numbers three and four are both special in scripture. Three is a number that represents God and the divine presence, four is a number of universality, like the four corners of the earth. You add the numbers, and you have seven, which shows up quite a bit in Scripture. Multiply three and four, and you have twelve. A powerful statement of God's presence in the world. Well, let's take it even further. Bring the 12 from the Old Testament and the 12 from the New Testament and you have 24, which is also the number of thrones around the throne in heaven. This is a complete picture of God's plan to bring all people, to unite all people to one glorious end. We are all, we will all behold the glory of God as words can never describe accurately. We will all be in this beauty and grace and goodness and love of our God. That is, that this life of struggle and pain and loss is preparing us to receive. Everything, everything we face today is a prelude to that glory. Glimpses of that day surround us. When that door is shut, God is providing a window if we will see it. God's goodness is always with us and all of God's children, especially those whom we need to love. To God be the glory. Amen. In response to the word of God, friends, I invite you to join with me in reaffirming our faith, stating our beliefs, what it is that we stand on as Presbyterians in the Reformed tradition. This is an important part of our life together. Let us join together in the words of Colossians 1. Let us rise and express our faith through these words of Scripture. Friends, what do you believe? Christ Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, 
whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile all himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. Amen and amen. Let us join together now, friends, in hymn number 829, My Faith Looks Up to Thee. As we turn our attention now to the sharing of prayer, the giving of the giving to God, those things, maybe those closed doors uh, and looking for windows, those things in our lives that cause us trouble and dread. I certainly would invite you to continue holding our folks in your prayers uh, who are on our prayer list. Um, keep them in your hearts and also in particular. Um, you may have heard, uh, well, Allison Martin is now at the Moore Center. She's in 109 of the Brantley Wing. Um, she got there the other day, and she's going through her therapy now and, and starting that road, a difficult road. Let me say that again, difficult road to recovery that is before her. But do keep her in your hearts and prayers um, as she goes through this time. She Right now, they're kind of thinking maybe a month um, We'll just see how things work and, and what happens. Also, Mike McCoy is, is still at uh, Lynchburg General. He's in room 390. Uh, right now, they're talking surgery for him on Wednesday. They kind of There's things they have to coordinate and things that have to come into place, but it looks like he'll be able to have his the surgery he needs, uh, that he really needs, it'll be on uh, Wednesday. 
So, and, and actually, he, if the surgery goes well on Wednesday, he'll be on Thursday. So, that's the, that's the way it is. Uh, at first, he told me the surgery was outpatient. Um, but okay. Uh, others, we need to hold in our prayers today. I mentioned the situation in Ukraine. Well, friends, let us join together in the, in the blessing of this moment because we are here in the Spirit of God in the presence of Christ. Let us recognize and honor that with our prayer. Almighty, merciful Savior, in this moment of beauty, as we continue to behold the blessings, the glories of nature around us, the blooms that continue to remind us just the glory of your creation and hand at work in this world, we thank you. But as we also recognize the blessings, the glory, the beauty around us, we struggle with the things that are within us and between us. We know how we have failed and how others have failed us. We know how our bodies have uh, struggled to keep up with time and age. We know how so much of this world ends up in failure and in disappointment. But yet, God, your goodness comes to us and speaks to us and points us in a different direction, in a direction that is not bound to this world, but works through this world and takes us home. In this day, in this house, in this moment, remind us of your care for all of us, how precious each and every one of us is. How nothing in all creation can tear us away from your love. How all things work for good for those who are called according to your purposes and who know your love. This world does not own us. We are creatures in this world, but not of this world. And while, yes, this world is your good creation, and one day we will see the renewal of this world in perfection. While we still tread these, these roads, as we still take these steps, as we still live our days here in this world, show us such care and compassion that we can reflect that care and compassion in the lives of others. Show us such love that we can continue to grow in that love. Inspire us, lead us, gather us together for what is next. Help us to be eager and anticipate what you are about to do here in our lives, in our church, in our community, in our country, across this world. Show us your leading good, wise, and just hand and, and show us that hand at work in the lives of our leaders, those who are leading us, protecting us, serving the public good, those who are providing health and life and protection and safety. Show us your goodness in all of these persons as we seek a better world, as we seek to better demonstrate your kingdom here and now. Thank you for the sacrifices that are made. Honor those sacrifices by greater expressions of love and peace and justice and mercy. We do pray for those who are sick and struggling in this moment. Bless them in body, mind, and spirit. We pray for those who are struggling in places of war, famine, pestilence. Bless them in greater life and the help and support and care of others. Turn evil thoughts, evil desires, evil actions. Turn them. Show us your goodness. We rejoice in this day for so many good things, even though we carry our weights and burdens. We know you are with us. You are with us here, gathered in your precious name as people in Christ Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
as we also remember our gifts and the ways that we contribute God's blessing to the good of others. Uh, if you'd like to leave anything and have not already, you're welcome to do so. At every exit, there is a plate uh, where you may leave whatever it is that you would like to contribute to the work of God through this church. Um, but as we contemplate what our gifts are, whatever they may be, join with me in our prayer for offering these things to God. Our gifts may seem small and weak next to your blessings, O oh God, but use these gifts, whatever they may be, to become your next blessings in this world, to the good of our neighbor and all who look for your goodness. In Christ we pray. Amen. Our final hymn, friends, 223, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, which you heard earlier, and so now you can sing it with gusto, right? Let us rise. Yes, friends, we go forth today as people of the cross, probably the most beautiful way that we see that even in the darkest and ugliest and most difficult times, God is working something good. That's why the cross today can be such a beautiful thing, even though it was such an ugly device at the time. It's an amazing thing how God's grace works. And I pray this grace works for you in this way bringing us to a greater realization of that love of God that carries us through all of our times. And I can't tell you it'll be easy, and I don't know any, I have no idea what those windows will look like, but I believe they will be there. Jesus is with us. God is with us. The Holy Spirit is with us. And may the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit uphold you as you go from this place to this task being the faithful people of God here in this community, sharing in God's goodness and growing in God's grace and being the people of love, the people of love, not only for those whom we already love, 
but also for those whom God is calling us to love this day and every day. Amen.